Hello, welcome to this program titled Hot Topics in Systemic Lupus Erythematosus, Overcoming Barriers to Optimize Patient Outcomes. Welcome, I'm Dr. Elena Maserati, Associate Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School and Vice Chair of Clinical Affairs and Director of Clinical Trials for the Lupus Center here at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. In this program, we have three videos focused on, one, the pathophysiology of lupus, two, individualizing treatment regimens to reduce the daily dose of glucocorticoids, and three, targeted biologic treatment options. So what's the prevalence of lupus? So according to the Lupus Foundation of America, about one and a half million Americans have lupus. It's estimated that about 16,000 new cases each year in the United States occur. About nine out of 10 people living with lupus are women. And it's about two to three times more prevalent in women of color. Lupus affects about one in 537 young African American women. What do we know about the mortality rate in lupus? Well, though mortality rates have improved over the last 50 years, the 10-year survival rates are still behind the general population. Lupus is one of the leading causes of death in women. In younger women, mortality is attributed to active lupus disease activity and infections. And that's one of the reasons why we emphasize the importance of vaccination in patients with lupus taking immunosuppressive agents. In older women, mortality is associated with atherosclerotic coronary vascular disease, like myocardial infarction and stroke. So what disease burdens are associated with lupus? Well, we know that lupus has an unpredictable disease course with remissions and flares that lead to cumulative organ damage and mortality. About 65% of patients, though, list pain as being one of the most challenging aspects of their disease. Lupus is heterogeneous, both in presentation and in the organs that it affects. But the most common organs affected are the joints, the skin, and the kidneys. Organ damage is also attributable to the chronic use of steroids. So one of the main goals of treatment is to mitigate or abrogate or eliminate the use of steroids. Patients with lupus also have high rates of depression and anxiety that need to be addressed in the course of treatment. Lupus has a negative impact on the quality of life. It's also a very expensive disease in terms of high health care costs and significant productivity loss. The average annual direct health care costs of a person with lupus are about $34,000 a year. Two out of three patients with lupus report some sort of loss of income because of complications of lupus. And about a third experience temporary disability due to the disease itself. So let's talk a little bit about pathogenesis. So over the years, we've come to understand the importance of type 1 interferons in the pathogenesis of lupus. There are interferon-inducible genes that are overexpressed in lupus. This is based on the work of Peggy Crow. Type 1 interferons modulate activate, activation of several aspects of the immune system, including B and T cells, dendritic cells, and neutrophils and a high interference signature tends to associate with disease severity. Interferons are normally produced in our, in our bodies. They're produced by leukocytes, especially plasmacytoid dendritic cells, during the innate response to viral infections. Uh, it plays an immunomodulatory role that links both innate and adaptive immune systems. So dysregulation of activation of type 1 interferons can contribute to the development of lupus. Um, they're triggered by self-nucleic acids in autoimmune complexes, which result from defects in apoptotic cells uh, or dysregulated neutrophil function. There's a loss of the negative feedback signal usually required to switch off type 1 interferon signaling. And there's also a breakdown of peripheral tolerance. So the type 1 interferon alpha-beta receptor signaling is critical for autoreactive B cell development. B cell activating factor, or BAF, is commonly overexpressed in lupus and acts as a B cell survival factor, which supports autoreactive B cells and prevents their death. Buildup of autoimmune complexes can induce systemic and localized inflammation, leading to irreversible damage. So these two pathways, the type 1 interferon pathway and the BAF pathway, are important pathways to think about in the treatment of patients with lupus. So in light of the central roles of type 1 interferons in the immunopathology of lupus, biologics targeting the type 1 interferon pathway and downstream adaptive immune cells have been developed with variable success in clinical trials. So there are 
basically two groups of drugs I'd like to talk mention. Um, so off-label rituximab, and then we also have FDA-approved belimumab and anafrolumab. So rituximab um, is, promotes B cell depletion by binding to CD20 on the surface of the, of the B cell. It's an off-label medication. But two pivotal trials, the Explorer trial and the Lunar trial, um, failed to meet their primary endpoints. And so the, the drug has not been FDA approved for SLE. But it's still used for certain manifestations, refractory lupus nephritis, immune-mediated thrombocytopenia in particular, and hemolytic anemia related to lupus. It's also used in catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome. Belimumab is FDA approved. <clears throat> it was um, approved in 2011, in March of 2011, for patients with lupus uh, who have active autoantibody positive lupus and are receiving standard therapy. It's a monoclonal antibody that blocks that B cell activating factor we talked about earlier. Uh, and indirectly uh, inhibits B cell proliferation. It can be given intravenously or subcutaneously and um, is, uh, has an auto-injector uh, as well. In 2019, it was approved for use in children, FDA approved for children over the age of five. And then in 2021, it received an additional indication for the treatment of patients with active lupus nephritis who are receiving standard therapy. So there were two pivotal phase three trials for um, belimumab, um, which ultimately led to its approval uh, in March of 2011. Um, these trials used the SLE responder index at week 52 um, for the primary outcome measure. So in BLISS 52, <clears throat> about 51% and 58% of patients achieved the SRI response at 52 weeks at a dose of one milligram per kilogram IV and 10 milligrams per kilogram respectively, compared with 44% of patients who were administered placebo. In BLISS 76, which basically had an identical design, 43% of patients achieved an SRI response at week 52 uh, for the 10 milligram per kilogram dose compared with 34% of patients who were administered placebo. Um, the safety considerations with bulimimab uh, included uh, infection and hypersensitivity reactions and mood changes. But one of the things we've learned about bulimimab over the last 12 years is that it's a very safe medication given over time, and patients tolerate it reasonably well. Anafrolumab uh, was approved in 2021, FDA approved, for the treatment of adults with moderate to severe lupus. It's a monoclonal antibody that inhibits signaling of all type 1 interferons by binding to the receptor. Uh, it's an infusion that's given every month, uh, and a subcutaneous form is being developed in clinical trials. Um, and uh, there is an ongoing trial looking at its use in patients with lupus nephritis, and that's called the IRIS trial. Let's talk a little bit about anafrolumab phase three clinical trials. So despite reaching several secondary endpoints, anafrolumab didn't reach its primary endpoint of SRI4 in the first of two phase three clinical trials. That was called TULIP1. Uh, and based on an analysis, though, from TULIP1, a different outcome measure was used as the primary endpoint for the second phase three trial called TULIP2. And this outcome measure is called the uh, BICLA, or the British Isles Lupus Assessment Group um, Composite Lupus Assessment Response. That's a mouthful. So the BICLA basically incorporates BILAG uh, into the uh, outcome measure. And that, again, was used in TULIP2. So in TULIP2, Again, using Bicla, 48% uh, of patients who were administered anafolumab 300 milligrams every four weeks achieved the Bicla response at 52 weeks compared with 32% on placebo or standard of care. Adverse reactions were typically mild to moderate uh, and included viral infections, upper respiratory tract infections, bronchitis, and importantly, uh, zoster. So zoster and bronchitis occurred in 7.2% and 12.2% of patients, respectively, who received anafolumab. Uh, and there was one death from pneumonia in the anafolumab group. So in a post hoc analysis of both TULIP-1 and TULIP-2, uh, anafolumab was compared with placebo, um, showed that there was greater improvement in musculoskeletal disease, 
mucocutaneous disease especially, in the immunological system. Um, there was rapid improvement in skin disease, uh, in, in, which is important to patients due to the visibility of these lesions affecting quality of life, socialization, and body image. Patients treated with antifarimab were 72% more likely to have sustained um, improvement in a, an objective measure of skin response called the CLASI uh, at week uh, two week 52 compared with placebo-controlled patients. Um, and there was a rapid uh, response uh, uh, in the cutaneous system as early as the first two months. Um, glucocorticoid reductions from baseline were greater in antifarimab-treated patients from week 20 through about week 52 compared to placebo patients. So again, you may need to wait a little bit to see the effect uh, therapeutic benefit of antifarimab. What about lupus remission with antifarimab? Um, so there was a post hoc pool TULIP1 and TULIP2 data sets that examined SLE remission. So the use of antifarimab was associated with a five-fold increase in likelihood of achieving sustained remission for greater than or equal to seven months compared with placebo. About, almost about 10% of antifarimab-treated participants compared with just 3% of placebo patients achieve remission, again, between uh, weeks 36 and 52, so a little later. Uh, remission was achieved earlier, though, in patients treated with antifarimab compared with placebo. So what about the safety of antifarimab? What have we learned about that? Um, so the longest safety data are available from an open-label extension study of the phase two study called the MUSE uh, study. And in that study, we saw a similar frequency and pattern of adverse events over three years compared with these, those observed in the first year in the parent study. Again, shingles occurred in about 4.3% of patients treated with antifarimab. So it's critically important that patients with uh, lupus who are being treated with antifarimab or being considered for treatment be vaccinated with the zoster vaccine recombinant adjuvenated uh, vaccine. Um, there have been no new safety signals identified since its approval. Um, overall, long-term antifarimab treatment uh, demonstrated an acceptable safety profile with sustained improvement in the SLED-I2K. Uh, there's an ongoing long-term placebo-controlled observation extension study of patients enrolled in both pivotal uh, phase three trials, the TULIP-1 and TULIP-2, which provide more long-term data, and we look forward to seeing those results. So let's summarize some of the points we made in the prior slides. So lupus is a prevalent diagnosis, especially in young women, and it can lead to extensive organ damage and higher mortality rates compared with the general population. Our current understanding of the pathophysiology of lupus lends itself to the development of therapies that target components of the type 1 interferon pathway and downstream adaptive immune components. There are two biologic therapies that are currently FDA approved for the treatment of lupus, antifolumab and belimumab, both monoclonal antibodies, and they have different immune targets, antifolumab, the type 1 interferon receptor, alpha receptor, and belimumab, B-cell activating factor. Thank you for joining me for this Hot Topics discussion on systemic lupus erythematosus. Please review the other videos in the educational series focused on improving care in patients with lupus. Please subscribe to Exchange CME's YouTube channel and check back regularly for updates and new videos.